famous scholarly monk from Bangkok who was very skeptical about the forest tradition, about the possibility of meditating and getting somewhere in the meditation. Once went to visit a John Munn and asked him, here you are out in the forest meditating all alone. Where do you go to listen to the Dharma? He said, I'm in Bangkok, all these great Dharma teachers all around. And even then I come up with problems that I can't solve, they can't solve. So what hope do you have here out in the forest? Where can you listen to the Dharma? And John Mun's response was, I hear the Dharma all the time, 24 hours a day, except when I'm asleep. And the monk said, well, it shows you know how to listen. And it's true, the Dharma is always proclaiming itself wherever you look, if you look right, if you tune in to the fact that there is Dharma being. Taught. Well, it's not really taught, it's just the way things are, and they just show the way things are, the way they are, by their behavior. You look around, as John Mun said, you see a leaf fall, teaches you the principle of inconstancy and permanence. You hear a monkey call, stress and suffering. It's all around us. When the Buddha taught the Dharma and the Vinaya, he used different words. He said the Dharma was something he just simply pointed out. The Vinaya was something he formulated, and he put together the rules for the Vinaya. But the Dharma is something already there. And all he had to do was point it out so people could see. So this is a principle we, we have to develop, the ability to hear the Dharma all the time, to see the Dharma all the time, so we don't have to be dependent on somebody else telling us the Dharma and wondering if the words are true or the words are not true. Of course, one of the problems is that we're surrounded by people with lots of anti-Dharma attitudes. But that's the nature of human society in general. And so in order to tune into the Dharma, you have to learn how to tune out a lot of the messages that are being sent your way. And it requires a a whole set of skills. One is to make sure that your intention is skillful in what you do and you say and you think. This is why we have those passages on the, on the Brahma Viharas every evening. It's not that we're praying to some god to make these things happen, that everybody be happy. And it's not that we believe that simply by wishing it is going to be so. As the Buddha once said, if things could be made true simply by wishing and praying, there wouldn't be any poor people, any sick people, any ill people in the world. I mean, the good things in the world have to happen because people had good intentions and acted on those intentions. And so that's what we're doing as we develop goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. So working on our intentions to make sure that our intentions are straight, they're in line with the Dharma. And that much right there helps tune us in, because it focuses on the point that our actions are the important things in the world. What we're doing right here, right now, that's the most important thing, which is very different from the message that we get from everybody else. The news out there, what somebody else is doing someplace else, that's more important. You're just a loser sitting here watching TV or listening to the radio or on the, on the web, absorbing what the, the real actors in the world are doing. And 
then we get sucked into the illusion that, well, maybe if I send out a message, I become, I become an important actor too. But the really important thing and things are what you're doing in your mind, because that becomes the basis for what you say, what you do, what you think. So there's one way we tune into the Dharma. And then anything you find that helps to support that, you know you're listening to the Dharma. Anything that pulls attention away from that, you know you're listening to something that's not Dharma. Because that's one of the important factors of equanimity is the sense of detachment. We need the compassion and goodwill so detachment doesn't become cold, indifferent, hard-hearted. But the detachment of equanimity is important to step back a bit so we don't get sucked into the ways of the world. Because what do they have? They have gain and loss. And we've seen a lot of this recently. People doing things that they think are going to make them wealthy to get ahead in life and turns around that they were shooting themselves in the feet. Things that people do for status, the things that people do for praise, end up causing a lot of suffering for themselves and for the people around them. When you look at the human condition, you have to have a sense of irony. That everybody's motivated when there's, by the desire for happiness, and yet look what we do. We create more misery than any other species on the planet, and we're supposed to be smarter. And so we need to step back a bit, again, when you're trying to tune into the Dharma, and yet all everybody else is blaring other messages, you have to learn how to not let them overwhelm or drown out the Dharma. So it's good to develop a certain sense of detachment. This is one of the things I liked about Ajahn Fuang when I was staying with him in Thailand, especially when I first met him. I was really struck by how he was a Thai person, and yet he seemed to be standing outside of Thai society. He wasn't swept up with the usual cares and concerns. And this is typical of the forest tradition in general. It goes way back in the Buddhist tradition. This is one of the reasons why we come out into the wilderness, to get that sense of perspective. So we're not spinning around with everybody else, we're standing outside of the spinning. And it's important to keep reminding ourselves that the things that people run after are not really all that real, all that worthwhile. They have old remains of forest monasteries in Sri Lanka. And most of the remains are really plain, just they were brick buildings. And all they have now are the brick foundations. The one thing that was really elaborate, though, were the stones and the urinals. They had pictures of palaces. So the monks were pissing on palaces every day. That could be the title for tonight's talk. I suppose I should say whether well, they're pissing with compassion, but no, probably not. <laughs> I think it's emblematic of an attitude that's really healthy. You look at all the things that people run after, power, wealth, fame, as Twiggy once said, all those horrible things. And if that's what you're tuned into, you're not going to hear the Dharma. You've got to tune into other things. You have to tune into compassion. You have to tune into kindness. You have to tune into heedfulness, that our actions really are important. And you've got to be careful how you act. And you can't allow yourself to waste your time over things that are really of no use at all. Because the question is, given that life is so short, what are you going to take with you? When I was in New York last month, I gave a series of talks on not-self. And one of the talks I focused on the whole issue of rebirth, and how rebirth was an important teaching on not-self. Everyone looked kind of quizzical. 
But the connection comes in the sutta where Ratabal is talking to, a, to the king, Gaurabhya. The king had asked him, why did you ordain? Your, your family's healthy, you're healthy, you haven't suffered any loss. What would inspire you to, to go forth? And Ratabala said, among other things, that the world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. And the king said, well, how, did, how can you explain that? I've got lots of wealth. And Ratabala says, well, can you take it with you? And the king had to admit, well, no. When I die, I have to leave everything behind. Death is the main teaching on not self, but also teaches that there are some things that you do carry over. You do take with you. You take your karma. You take the qualities of mind that you develop. And so you have to make sure that that's what really matters. What we're living for is developing the qualities. In some cases, are called the noble treasures of conviction, virtue, a sense of shame and compunction over the idea of doing something harmful, the willingness to learn, generosity, wisdom. These are qualities of mind that are good to take with you, because death is like being suddenly evacuated with no time to pack your bags, to find yourself in a new land, a new place, and all you have are your skill sets. So what skills do you have? Focus in on that. Listen to that question. Keep that question in mind, because that's what enables you to hear the Dharma and other things that you notice around you. You see other people, and some of them are working on their skill sets, and other people are working on who knows what. And you look at them and say, okay, is this something I want to take as a, as a model for my behavior, or is this something I have to learn from saying this is precisely what not to do? And again, you're not just passing judgment on the value of the person. You're looking at the person as, as a possible guide and deciding whether you want to take that person's actions as a guide to your own. So it's not harsh and judgmental to look at people this way. The Buddha never said that it was wrong to judge other people. I was reading a book a while back where it supposedly is a quote from the Pali Canon where the Buddha says, if you judge other people, you destroy yourself. It was, it was an interpolation. The Buddha never said that. You have to learn how to judge people wisely in terms of the skill or lack of skill in their actions. The Buddha, for the purpose of asking yourself then, well, is this someone that I want to take as an example or not? And when you see other people who've, through their greed and heedlessness, have destroyed their, their wealth, destroyed their status, destroyed the company that they worked for, you take it as a, as a warning signal. Okay, there's, there's a Dharma lesson right there. You see someone who's found peace of mind. Okay, there's a Dharma lesson right there. But the important thing is to detach yourself from the usual snares of the world. They dangle things in front of your face and lead you on. And so you cannot really hear the message of the Dharma. It's like that cartoon in The New Yorker. There's people walking around with a big stick coming up their back and hanging down in front of them by a string as a carrot. And they're all walking around after the carrots. And there's one guy who gets to drive his carrot down the road. Okay, we're all going after those dangling carrots, and that's why we don't really see the Dharma around us. So learn how to step back and put a question mark around the message you're getting, messages you're getting from the people around you, from the media, from whatever. And say, okay, is that a Dharma lesson or is that a non-Dharma lesson? There's got to be a Dharma lesson in here someplace. It's like tuning in your radio. There are all these different radio waves or different frequencies going through the air right now. And you 
tune into one frequency and you get classical music, you tune into another frequency and you get Tawana. Another frequency, you get hate radio. I mean, it's all there in the air. The question is, where are you going to tune in? If you tune in properly, you tune into the Dharma because it's there too. But it requires the right attitude. On the one hand, your desire to be skillful, to search for happiness in a way that embodies goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and the equanimity that allows you to step back and question any non-Dharma stations that are out there, any non-Dharma frequencies. And when you learn to tune in your mind just right, you find that the Dharma is there, as John Munn said, 24 hours a day. It's there to listen to, it's there to see whenever you want it. If you know how to listen, if you know how to look. <laughs>